Hello everyone and welcome back to the Film Score Podcast. Today my guest is Benjamin John Power, also known as Blank Mass. This was a really exciting interview for me because I became a big fan of Blank Mass's work back in early 2020 when he released his debut film score, which ended up winning an Ivor Novello, for Calm With Horses, or as for some reason it's called in the US, A Shadow of Violence. That ended up being one of my favorite scores of 2020, and caused me to really go down a rabbit hole of all of his solo back catalog, which is a combination of some field recordings, particularly in his latest album, Inferno, and just really weird electronics. Not going to be up everyone's alley, but it is certainly up mine. But today we spend a lot of time talking about his two new scores. The first one, and one that we actually never intended to talk about in the first place, is for Gaza, which is about the football player from the 90s. And that's actually a movie that's shown in two parts out in the UK, on the BBC. And at some point, I'm sure, will be released in the US. But the main topic of our conversation was his score for Ted K, a dramatization about the later life of eco-terrorist Ted Kaczynski. Blank Mass's score for this is a mixture of these darker yet gentler ambient passages and almost militaristic pounding synth work. It's great. It's, it's certainly one of my favorite scores so far this year, and I highly, highly recommend checking it out. Now, one word of warning for this episode. I think there are two explicit words said that I did not censor out, simply because they are the name of one of Blank Mass's older bands, and that felt a little weird censoring a band's name. So if you're particularly sensitive to some foul language, like I said, it's two words, but keep that in mind as you listen. Of course, you can find more about Blank Mass on social media or his website, and naturally you can do the same for me. So... Sit back, and I hope you enjoy. Well, Ben, I'm so glad you could join me today. How have you been? I've been good. Thank you. Yeah, I've managed to, I've managed to stay busy through the, the craziness, which I can only be very, very um, thankful for. Maybe thankful is the wrong word, um, considering what has been going on. But um, on a very personal level, I'm glad that I haven't had to jack it all in with not being able to tour. In, in that sense, I, I do feel lucky. I guess. Uh, again, that feels like the wrong word, but you know. <laughs> well, it's it's got to be a little fortunate, too, having not just the new burgeoning film scoring career, but also a parallel solo output career, too, that you can always do when you're stuck in isolation. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I, I mean, and, and, you know, for the for the majority of um, with the with the exception of Inferno, which was, you know, the manifestation of 10 years worth of um, field recordings and such presented in what could potentially be perceived as an album format. <laughs> um, outside of that, I have just been just scoring stuff. So it's it's kind of wild that it all kind of started to happen. As the world kind of started to fall to pieces, uh, if, <laughs> you know, um, but um, there we have it. Yeah, well, and, and actually on, on that note, and the big thing we want to talk about today is is your score for Ted K, which the film just came out in, in March, and I know the vinyl is coming out in, in June, I think. But I, I had seen, you know, you were teasing the announcement for the last week or two about a big new project, and I think it's a, a mini series, maybe called Gaza. That I think the first episode is it coming out later this week? Well, it's actually tomorrow, and I, that you know, it, it's actually a feature length, but um, it's spread over two episodes on the okay. BBC right now. And you know, Gaza is a famous football player from the '90s. You know, arguably one of the best in the world. Obviously, sorry for the benefit of yourself and um, others who live across the pond. That's soccer, (laughs) not football. But, um, you know, he lived a very um, tumultuous life and, you know, is um, struggled with alcoholism and mental health issues. And also, you know, there is um, domestic violence that took place, you know, at his hands. And, um, but, you know, also was one of the greatest football players to ever live, especially as considered so over here. 
it's as much a film about the insidious UK tabloid press and how they treat celebrity. That's arguably more the subject matter than the fact that he was a world-class football player and everything that comes hand in hand with how the tabloid press treat celebrity. So yes, so I'm, I'm very excited to have that one out. There was a little crossover scoring this and, and Ted K. So that's where I've been and I'm glad they're both finally out there for people to, um, to see. I bet. And yeah, I mean, that, that does sound really interesting, especially framing it as, as the tabloid treatment of him, just because it's something that, despite being an American, like you see very often the UK media treatment of, uh, of Meghan Markle, for instance, or famously of Princess Diana. Yeah, and, you know, Amy Winehouse and, and, and such, mm. you know, it, it's, it's insidious to use that word again, you know, and it doesn't really seem to let up <laughs> so to speak really so it's a case study in that really but i mean it's out it's out tomorrow which is interesting because ted ted k isn't actually out over here yet in the uk really yeah yeah um, i'm not too sure exactly when it's dropping either so gaza if somebody if somebody who is interested in the blank mass score stuff they'll probably see gaza before they see ted k over here but um that's just distribution and the way things work i guess yeah. um there's a whole load of things that get sorted out um that are outside of my realm of understanding even at the moment you know can you give us um the timing's weird because obviously as of recording it isn't out but when this is released the film will be out can you give us a little overview or or tease of what your score for gaza is what it's like uh, it's interesting. So obviously the first, I, I don't want to give, yeah, well, yeah, as you said, I don't want to give too much away, but it will it will be out over here by the time this goes out. So I guess it doesn't really matter so much. The first half of the film kind of tracks his rise to success from small town kind of local club football player and his very, very rapid rise to success. And, you know, this happens late 80s, early 90s. And there was an element of that that I actually wanted to kind of like bring in in a diegetic sense music of the time, you know, early rave and, you know, New Order kind of sounding things. And, you, you know, that kind of Manchester kind of crossover thing that happened around that time that was very electronic. So, you know, I can turn my hand to that with ease. But obviously, you know, this it's diegetic of a time in the UK, I think. And it's very exciting and it's very naive staring towards the lights and fame and you know what that may bring then when we introduce the press and the alcoholism and stuff which happens towards the second half we take a lot more kind of sinister and potentially more kind of conventional but not i, I don't like to use that word but more a, a, more of a kind of like recognized blank mass form with the score so that was interesting trying to kind of bring these two almost disparate elements together and tell this story play out, you know, in a chronological sense, um, kind of direct you into the right place. You know, I feel like some elements of the score, as as with Ted K, the main focus is perspective, you know, how, how they may see how, if they were to have an internal score, how that might play out in their head. Some stuff is more broad and a wider perspective, um, outside looking in. It's still character based though. I, I feel like, you know, the press is itself a character and the time that the whole story played out itself is a character as well. So there's a lot to think about doing these things and that that's one one question I always ask any director when I first start working on something on any kind of cue. It's like whose perspective is this from right now? And then you have to try and land in that space as best you can, I guess. <laughs> it's it's interesting you mention that because it is very clear that that's I mean, it's a perspective that you work from in a lot of these projects because, you, like you mentioned, you you get it in uh, in Ted K from his perspective quite often, but also in in Calm with Horses, there are quite a few moments and um, like some of these montages where you're getting the the viewpoint both musically and on the image perspective from from Arm, what's going on in his head as well. Yeah, I, I would say that Ted. K is maybe the one that I've worked on so far where most of the cues are from his perceived perspective. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. from his perspective. That was kind of my main kind of goal there with that one. For better, for worse, trying to envision what 
might be happening inside a uh, proto intel terrorist's head. And I, I imagine it's not the easiest headspace to get into. Well, not for me because that's not me as a person, and you know, <laughs> you know. But I, but I feel like you know, it, it, it's part of the job to kind of at least try and access that. Do you know what I mean? For for better for worse, obviously, you know, whether they're environmentalists or not, nobody who worked on the project believes that it's right to kill a bunch of people to achieve what you think is the bettering of humanity. I mean, it's it it's it's a. Uh, it it cancels itself out, does it not? Do you know what I mean? Like you you yeah. work you work you, you feel like you're. Ugh, anyways, I I try not to speak about that too much because it's almost secondary to the sonics of what I was involved in in working on this project. Let it be known that you know I I do not agree with Ted Kaczynski. You know, <laughs> but that's the thing is I think somehow some people have missed the nuance that just because you're working on a project that shows something it mm. doesn't mean that you endorse it and absolutely I mean, and you know there's I... there's there's no way you can watch the film and be like oh yeah these guys like they must have loved ted k yeah i mean, I mean it's, yeah. It, it it seems like a very um snap kind of assessment or judgment somebody has to score these movies you know <laughs> do you know what i mean it's our job and and i think that, that is a little that is a little closed off to what composers do to assume that somebody who has scored something or somebody who has made a documentary about something agrees with the politics. I mean, to me, that just doesn't make much sense. Yeah, I mean, I I totally agree with you. And I know that you got involved in Ted K through the director and his partner seeing, I think it was seeing Calm With Horses, and then they got interested. But what was it that drew you to the project? Well, so I... Actually, you know, I Ted K was an interesting one because I um I've been friends with the director of photography Nathan Corbin for quite some time, and you know, um you know I was a fan of his band that he was in years ago, Acceptor, and you know when Fuck Buttons were coming up, Acceptor were happening around the same time. You know, we were in London, they were in New York, but we were part of a kind of wider kind of like weirdo noise kind of community with like Black Dice and such, and growing and all these guys and and. I wasn't aware that Nathan was uh, the DP until Tony mentioned it, and I was very aware of his work as a DP, you know, with videos that he made from my friend's band Hate Rock. And, and I um, I saw how beautiful Ted looked with the vistas, and t- to me, when I watched it, I was like, outside of the subject matter, this is like a playground for me. I can see what I'm supposed to do here. I can see what I'm supposed to do here before even having any conversations with Tony about what we were going to say. I mean, this was one of the ones that, you know, I sent I sent the main theme through to Tony before we'd even discussed what he wanted the main theme to achieve. So I just worked on that instinctively. I think that kind of sealed the deal, actually. Um, it's difficult to say, but the first, like, the first instance, the thing that drew me towards it most was how beautiful it looked. That's something that so much of the film lives in is inside of the wilderness of Montana and these beautiful shots. And setting aside the Ted K politics of it, you are placed in admiring the beauty and then seeing people interloping and, and invading it. It does create a very interesting backdrop and interesting conflict that's kind of constantly going on behind the scenes. So I can see how that combination would be. Very intriguing and get those creative juices flowing almost immediately. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's 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 like rich in um, content for somebody like me. I think when you first look at something like that, it's it 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 almost spells out what you need to do for you, to a degree. And obviously, there are certain places where you can flip that on its head to um, varying degrees of success. But I feel like I I was presented with enough ammunition just from the first run through. Did you think that? I mean, and you've commented and recognized on the irony of you in particular coming in, having a very electronic score for a film about someone who's an eco-terrorist. Yeah. But was there ever a, a question in your mind of, does this combination make sense? To a certain degree, I guess I, I, guess I found a, a slight element of humor in the irony, which I, I guess when presented in an, in an overall a whole score that plays out. I guess it does make a, a lot of sense. I think, but um, th- there was a like a kind of juvenile 
humour that I found in the irony <laughs> of that very very much so, um, especially considering you know what what he did. So, um, so you started off the that main theme, the Montana theme. It's the first thing that kind of appeared to you. I'm so glad that was released as the single because you're already on the show, so I, I don't need to butter you up, but. That was a killer cue. Oh, thank like you the, so much. The mixture of like the the ritualism and like this primal chanting, and the like militaristic undertones. I mean, it kind of captures the whole perception that's inside of his head right in three minutes. I'm so glad because you know that was that was the kind of intent. And I mean, also you know that this first scene here when the snowmobiles are coming towards you, it feels like a Sergio Leone to me. It feels like a kind of. Um, a very kind of like yin and yang kind of idea of like man versus technology. He sees himself as the savior, you know, and this is this is like the soundtrack to what's going on. I, I feel potentially this is how he, he felt about himself. He felt like he was the savior of man riding to battle against the evils of technology. And this is, um, that's kind of why I ended up there. But um, again, as I, as I mentioned before, this was, one of the first ones I sent to Tony, and I think it kind of sealed the deal from there on in. I'm glad you see that. That's That certainly was the intention. And then you mentioning the juvenile humor in the irony. It's this big, massive cue, like you'd imagine you know, these great armies going to, and it effectively ends up with him breaking into a house and smashing up a snowmobile. With a sledgehammer. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. It's exactly, you know, the, once again, the, the irony is not lost, you know. <laughs> yes, uh, there's a slight reprise of, of the main theme while, whilst this is happening inside the house, you know, which mm-hmm. kind of almost kind of like, from that point, I think we start twisting into something very different once you're introduced, once, once he starts to speak, you know, and... I feel like we go to a different place there, but um, I'm not one to shy away from. I think there is obviously a place for it with regards to kind of contemporary scoring and such, where um, especially with electronic stuff, I feel like there is a tendency to kind of meander and not say so much in kind of like a um, like a hook sense, like a musical sense. And I, I definitely feel like, you know, I grew up on trying to bring a human or a melodic element into noise that's something that stuck with me a lot so you know i you know i want to write a main theme i want to write like the memorable movie theme so that's something i try and do there are moments later on in the film too where a lot of your score has these sort of gentle electronic soundscapes but there are a few other times later on where they're not themes necessarily but heavily melodic one later on he's he's in this grimy bathroom and there's just like this really killer dark electronic melody that gets him that's pulsing and it does a really good job of on a very basic level just mixing up what the actual like sonic palette is because look i i love drone and ambient but like sometimes it's also nice having that injection there and that's of what the score does I think so, yeah. I mean, it's something that I I think it's great to be able to hear something and, you know, say, oh, yeah, that's this part of um, Ted K, you know, when he's when he's shopping for bomb materials or, the, you know, this is the part of, you know, if you were to hear it in, in passing, you know, or this is the part of Ted K when he's running through the woods, like, you know, dressed in a bearskin tunic or whatever. It's it's nice. I, for me, I, I, I kind of, I, I do like that kind of, like, familiarity that kind of recognition when it comes to that kind of stuff but as you said like you know i can drone for days if i wanted (laughs) so So you had mentioned that especially watching the early cut of the film it felt like you knew where to go without ever having to talk to tony stone the director well well (laughs) for the in the in the in the first instance but you know yeah 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 yeah. i mean i mean up front you you watch you're like oh i have so many ideas i have an idea of where this should go yeah, or where I want to take it. But how did that evolve once you and Tony started talking? What were those conversations like? Uh, I, I feel like Tony and I were in a, in a pretty similar place, but he's very, very particular, you know, as, as most directors are, you know, he'd been, he'd been working on this, this film for five years or so. And mm. I, I feel like it, it was an interesting one because I, I'm in Edinburgh and Tony, for the majority of the time, whilst we were working on this, was in British Columbia. 
so there was a big time difference there and the, the collaborative element is where you end up in the sweet spot do you know what I mean like you know this isn't working for such and such a reason is there a way that this could you know you could take it there and, and I'm like well I'll try you know let's see those conversations would generally happen around 5 6 p.m my time so a lot of the time I was kind of working nights you know and then I would wake up and go into the studio and it would be his night time so I'd be like, OK, here's what we spoke about yesterday. It's still your today. What do you think? So I was essentially working night shifts. And I feel like that change in my routine, maybe on a personal level, if I was to have any kind of familiarity with the descent of Ted Kaczynski, did feel like I was going a little, you know, <laughs> um, a, li- a little, well, I don't know what would be the correct way of saying this, you know, I, not. I, I did feel like I wasn't particularly operating in my usual sphere, you know. I did feel like I was going a little crazy to a, to a degree. <laughs> so that probably had some bearing on where the score ended up. And obviously there was a very real sense of isolation, you know, real world stuff, because we're all in a lockdown. So I feel like that maybe had some kind of impact on where I ended up score-wise as well, to a degree. So I feel like... I found myself in two very real world situations that kind of maybe helped me occupy a space that I would never Mm. usually be in or used to, you know. And in getting out of that more typical space or the space that you're used to, other than the very surface level direct comparisons with the film, how do you think that that affected your process and the sound? Well, maybe just going back to what I said here, you know, I always um, approach any any of these things in in the the same kind of way. You know, my my process is highly explorative, and I you know I have a bunch of synthesizers in here, and you know I'm always experimenting and trying to. The canvas is always blank. I don't have like sometimes I will write at the piano back here, but that's if I know that it, it needs to be a melodic passage and I'm trying to ask a question or or trying to imagine like a romantic interaction or something like that. That usually starts around here, but I think this was like a little broader than that in a, in an explorative sense. Although there is like a you know a romantic theme arguably in this, but not in the way that one would interact with an emotional uh, romantic theme or whatever. And also I wasn't really set any boundaries by Tony as well. I mean, he's, he's very aware of my work as a, a, an electronic artist. And, you know, as far as electronic artists go, I definitely sit on like the weirder side of things. And yeah. I'm, I'm as happy writing a kind of weirdo alien space R&B tune than I, as I am a wall of drone or whatever. So I think that he wanted to see what weirdness I would bring to the environment. So honestly, you know, I, I didn't feel boxed in. I felt like I could try a lot of stuff out and could experiment and to try and land in the in the correct place. Um, yeah, so I hope I answered your question there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. One of the things you were mentioning too was how sometimes you'll go on the piano, start from there, especially mm-hmm. when you know you have a melody, but a lot of the times you're on the synths and just exploring. What does the exploration look like? Are you kind of chasing tones and sounds that you have in your mind or just seeing what comes out? A lot of the time I'll leave the I'll leave a scene playing and I'll jam along with it in a in a very kind of like basic term of the word, just jamming along to this. You can't you know sometimes I'll start from just like a you know a, a single waveform and then start layering things up. I like to use the the iridium quite a lot, the Waldorf synth for Ted K. Yeah. Um, I was using a lot of that, whereas, say, for example, Card With Horses, I was using a lot of OB6. That I found to be quite a good workstation, and, and I would use that in the very first instance to kind of start to um, shape and then, you know, build on top of that. When I find that I'm in a spot which is feeling right, then I'll start to remove stuff and then maybe start to add an, a melodic component and things like that, if if it needs be, if not, you know, just... It is very explorative in that sense. And, you know, I do tend to jam through these things whilst watching them in, in real time, essentially. I got you. Interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, how similar is that process to you working on solo blank mass records? Obviously, when you're, when you're doing those, you're not watching a scene in the background. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's very similar, really. Uh, I, but obviously, you have this you have this added layer to pay attention to, which is like you know the dynamic of what of what is happening in the in the moving picture. There, you, I don't have that when I'm writing. You know. <laughs> blank mass studio records for want of a better term you know this is it's a complete empty space that I start off with so one could say that's liberating to be in that position where you have no restrictions and no boundaries but having not collaborated for some time until I started to work on the film score stuff I find like the discipline there's a nostalgic element to the discipline but also it's a, it's a new discipline unto itself and I always find that collaboration between two potentially like disparate and um different practices where they meet and hit the um sweet spot that's kind of where the magic happens isn't it there are certainly kind of contrasts but there's also very rewarding kind of results from that kind of collaboration so is is that one of the things that drew you to working on film in the first place because i know of a while ago you were in fuck buttons with andrew hung and then I started the Blank Mass project, which went, again, from a collaboration to something that's more solo. Well, it's it's actually interesting. I mean, yes and no. I mean, I've, I've wanted to score movies since I was a child, really. And I just, the opportunity didn't really present itself to me for, for some time. And it's not for want of trying, you know, I would send emails to directors that I like for years and stuff and it and it didn't really happen but I but the the only thing I can think of is that potentially the directors that I would email and and stuff and don't ask me to any na- name any names now because <laughs> I would do it all all the time but they probably had their go-to composers at the time and I, and I feel like now it's it's potentially a golden age of of scoring for like electronic musicians like myself because feel like the directors and the producers that are working on these films that are up and coming now probably listen to fuck buttons and you know one of tricks point never and mika levi when they were growing up and now they're film producers so that's that's what i think maybe is um maybe what happened there to answer your question it's not for want of trying i've wanted to do it for years I, it just it's strange that it should happen at a point where i find myself not able to tour <laughs> it's lucky what sparked that interest in scoring from a young age because i talked to a lot of composers and they've always liked film but Mm -hmm. i think for a lot of people there's almost not even a recognition that a film composer is something that exists well yeah no absolutely i feel like it was the moment that i realized that ennio morricone's score for the good the bad and the ugly wasn't just the noises that happened in the film somebody had gone out and made this music and created this space and created this landscape and when i became aware of that at quite a young age i was like Fuck, i want to do that you know that's 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 what i want to do i want to i want to be the person that creates this space for this picture and i can almost pinpoint it to that particular point and i guess i would have been you know five or six or something at the time yeah that's great yeah i love that yeah but at this point now, having already a very established career, and you mentioned this much earlier, that in a way there isn't necessarily a conventional or typical blank mass sound, but there's obviously there's an identity. Were you worried about maintaining that identity when you started scoring and having those collaborations, or did it not even come into your head? No, because I don't, you know, for for instance, you know, I don't, I don't really believe in the concept of like a guilty pleasure. I think if you like something, you like something. And, and I feel precious about my art to a degree, but then in another way, I don't, you know, I don't feel like, you know, a Black Mass record has to be heavy industrial beats or it has to be like widespread extreme ambience. I don't feel like that's a testament to the sound of Blank Mass. I do. There is a part of that that is in me and always will be. But I also, I feel like if I can be in a position where I can utilize very diverse sonic ideas, but somebody can still tell it's me, then I feel like that's that's kind of what every artist wants, really, isn't it? That's kind of the job that you've kind of landed in. A pretty good spot there I'd say I mean I, I think it's very it's very easy for people nowadays to find their comfort zone and stay in there as much as I appreciate that security I feel like 
you find yourself getting more interesting results and, you know, feel good about yourself when you fall asleep at night if you know that you've tried something different, you know. I, I, didn't, I don't feel a, a pressure in that sense, no. There's certainly people um, in film and in non-film music that, like you said, they, they do find the comfort zone. I'm a big Slayer fan. You listen to a Slayer album from 30 years ago or from five years ago, and it's going to sound pretty similar. Like, the guys from the 50s, so, you know, they've slowed down a little bit, but that's that. Nothing wrong with it. Yeah, yeah. But for you, in, in wanting to continue to expand creatively, is it both the desire to keep trying something new, but is there also, would you also feel bored if you kept doing something that was the same? Yeah, I probably would feel bored. Yeah, I, I would feel bored to answer your question. I feel like um, I would feel um, claustrophobic, I think, is the word. Interesting. So then, in your mind, are there any genres or sounds or sonic palettes that you really want to explore that you haven't had the opportunity yet? I think it would be interesting to approach a score in the way where you have a piece of instrumentation which is uh, potentially integral to the story happening. Mm. For example, a friend of mine has just scored The Northman, mm. the Robert Eggers film. Two friends of mine have just scored the, the film, the Robert Eggers film, The Northman. And I know for a fact that um, Robert Eggers is very particular and very historically aware of the instrumentation that would have been used in this time period and was uh, keen to steer clear from electronic sounds as such and, you know, try and be very true to the historical content. And I feel like that would be something that would be very interesting to me because nobody's really put those boundaries upon me before when scoring something. I think it can only add to your practice, you know. I would find that interesting, probably quite difficult in the first instance, but I feel like it's something that I certainly want to try um also you know i've never worked with a full orchestra in in that sense for scoring any kind of orchestrated sounds have all been um made by me so um i would love to write something for orchestra i feel like that would be a challenge but you know that's kind of what i always envisioned envisioned myself doing when i was young like i was telling you before and even the first blank mass record really is when I was writing that, I did see that as being something that was, you know, orchestral sounding, but I just, I, I lived in a tiny flat in Dalston in, in East London, and I just didn't, you know, I had no money and I didn't have um, any connections in that world or anything like that. So um, I was trying to achieve that with what I had at my disposal. So I feel like to be be in that position at some point will kind of tick another box for me and, um, yeah. Very cool. I, I think hearing either of those premises will, I mean, it's doing that for me, but have a lot of people's brains start going, hmm, I, I wonder what an orchestral blank mass score will sound like, or a blank mass music that's constrained by what's available in the 15th century. Yes. Or, or whatever, really, you know, like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I feel like that It intrigues me too, you know, it's something that I would find Super, super interesting, especially the latter that you just mentioned. I think that would be very... I'll be sitting here hoping because, uh, candidly, when, when Calm With Horses came out, when the score was released in sometime in, in early 2020, I had never heard your music before, so I heard that. Oh, and wow. I was like, oh, shit, like, this is really good. Who is this guy? Now I have a few of your albums. Every time a score comes out of your site or an album, I'm always right there ready to listen. So if those oh, opportunities well, thank come you so out, much. Thank you. I'll be first in line. Amazing. Well, th- uh, you know, thank you for that. I, I appreciate that. It makes it all it makes it all worth it, as far as I'm concerned. You know. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, on on that note, Ben, I'll uh, I'll let you get on with your evening. I do really appreciate you joining me and sitting down to chat for a little bit. Absolutely. Thank you so much.